the third and last session of the mini course. Uh, uh, I'm gonna now, I'm not gonna say much now, in the end, we're gonna thank Professor Hayari for his, the effort and the amazing, amazing uh, mini course that I'm sure at some point you will benefit from it if you benefit it now with a certain percentage of information. Later, when you go in higher studies in mathematics, you will automatically in some way relate to things that you have seen here and get back to it and use it. The notes that you have are very valuable. Uh, keep them for future references for you. So now I'm going to leave uh, the floor for Professor Hayari. And uh, yes, that's it. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed the visit a lot, of course. Um, I'm going to try to give like stuff today that is like uh, you can apply it directly, right? So not only raw ideas, but more code that you can, if you want, copy and paste into Mathematica and then change as you like, and then see what the results look like. So uh, let me start with the Riemann Ziegel formula. So this gave, uh, you know, if you're interested in computing zeta on the critical line, you have this version called Z of T, which is a real valued version of zeta. It's a, a smooth function, right? So, uh, and it's the same as that earlier function uh, we called C of one half plus IT, except uh, it satisfies this relationship so that the size of Z of T matches the size of zeta. This one here actually is much smaller than the size of zeta when T is very high. And the theta T that appears here, this is the same theta T that gives you the main term in the zeros counting function, N of T, counting the number of ordinates up to T. And it's easy to compute, at least when T is large, because you have this you know, difference between the actual value of theta of T and this simple expression is bounded by some number, a small number over T cubed. So if like T is like 10 to the five, then you're already getting like 10 to the minus, minus 15 um, you know, accuracy, right? So we have all these formulas and yeah, this is the, I guess here I'm uh, emphasizing the problem with the C, why we shouldn't use it directly because it, it has a gamma factor in it, gamma one half plus IT. And this is how this gamma factor behaves um, when you go up very high on the critical line, it decays exponentially as t goes to infinity, right? Um, so the parameters for Riemann-Ziegel, like I stated them last time, here are the formulas. You have that the length of the main sum is about square root of t over two pi. And then you have this parameter z, which is some number between minus one and one. And this number gets uh, inserted in the correction term in the Riemann-Ziegel formula, which is this term, right? So you have a main sum of length k, it's an exponential sum, a sum of cosines, plus a, an easy to compute correction term. And we can assume, you know, t is greater than 200. Uh, so we can apply this explicit bound on the error RZ of t, which was due to Gapke in his thesis. And we have this formula for the correction term phi sub zero. And okay, so this is all you need to have to actually, you know, implement this formula. So here's an, it doesn't take long. Uh, and again, you can copy and paste this into Mathematica if you have it. Uh, I tried with it. So when I do this, sometimes like some formatting like gets a little messed, like two lines become next to each other instead of below each other. So just, you know, if you, cut and paste it and gives you an error, maybe it's a formatting issue. So you can just you know, check that. But these are the definitions of all the functions you saw there, the K1T, which is the length of the main sum, the Z function or Z number. And then you have this correction term. Notice here, I'm not evaluating the correction term P sub zero of Z using the original formula, because this could be unstable if z is like plus minus one half, which would be a singular, like a, it's a removable singularity of this function because when z is plus minus one half, both the numerator and denominator is zero. So to avoid like dividing a small number by another small number, 
I just use a series expansion uh, of this function about uh, zero and I'm taking the first 14 terms and this should work without a problem. I'm using the approximation for theta of t that I showed you before, which gives you something to within plus minus one over t cubed. And here's the mean sum plus a correction term, right? So like, I, I don't like the find root function in Mathematica. It's a function where you give it uh, like a command where you give it a function and then it finds a root of that function, you know, starting at a point to specify. So here I'm asking it to, to, to find a root of uh, Z of T uh, somewhere near 1,419. And it does that. It, sometimes it behaves in a weird way. So that's why I don't use it too much, but you can write an, a simple bisection method, you know, kind of looking for sign changes and then zooming in further and further. Uh, but uh, because uh, you know I, di I didn't want to fill this page with code, I just used the find root function in Mathematica. So what it found here is actually the 999th zeta zero, and uh, you can run this find the 1,000 uh, if you want. Right. Okay, and so here's the output. This is the ordinate of that 999th zeta zero. All right, are there any questions? Okay, right, so, okay. Well, we have now a, an implementation of Z of T. Well, how do we go about finding zeros? Do we just, or the roots of zeta? Do we just like randomly like evaluate at like thousand, a thousand ten, and then look for sign changes? Is there like a way to organize how you search for the non-trivial roots? And this is uh, provided by something called gram points. This was discovered by Graham. Um, so it relates to that function theta of t, which appeared in two places so far, in the zeros counting function and in the formula for z of t. So the nth Graham point is defined as the unique solution for this equation, uh, provided n is at least minus one and t greater than seven. Um, when, when n is minus one, there are actually two solutions if you allow to t below seven. So we're gonna keep uniqueness. So we're just looking at solutions with t greater than or equal to seven. And then you get a unique solution for this equation for any n greater than or equal to minus one. And the solution you get is called the nth gram point. So the zero with gram point is 17.845. And these are easy to compute because we have this uh, simple approximation for the theta of t, right? And because uh, the gram points, the spacing between them is about the same spacing as between the zeros of theta, because theta of t is exactly the main term in the zeros counting function, right? Uh, but they are regularly spaced because theta of t just like increases, you know, without like, you know, having jump discontinuities due to s of t. You know, s of t is absent in this setting. Gram points just depend on the theta function, on the theta of t function, right? So, and what Gram did when he, like looked at these points is that empirically, when he was looking for zeros, he noticed that there's usually a sign change of Z of T in the nth gram interval. And what the, what the nth gram interval is, um, the interval between um, G sub N and G sub N plus one. So between the nth gram point and the N plus first gram point. So this gave him a way to organize his search for ordinates of non-trivial zeros. He could compute the, these gram points easily and then within each interval kind of use his find root function to kind of restrict his search to that gram interval. And uh, yeah, so this sign change indicates that each gram interval usually contains a zero Z of T. Right? Okay, well, Graham's law, which is that observation that uh, an, a Graham interval contains a zero or a sign change, um, you know, if this actually held all the time, then you would prove the RH, right? The Riemann hypothesis would follow because you're basically getting the same number of zeros on the critical line as the total number you can have, which is one over pi theta t, right? Because that's the number of Graham points up to high t is about one over pi, um, uh, 
like at the underground point, you get like n of them, and this would match the number of zeros. So you, you would have proven all the zeros are on the critical line. But this gram load cannot hold, it has to fail infinitely often. Because if you imagine this formula, this is the zeros counting function. If Graham's law held all the time, then you can just by a little bit of reasoning, it doesn't take much at all, show that S of t will have to be less than two for any t in absolute value. But this would cause a contradiction because Salberg already proved and there are no hypothesis that S of t is unbounded. It has to get large in the positive direction and the negative direction. So Graham's law cannot hold universally or even you know, beyond a certain point. It has to fail infinitely often. Even though this is the case, you can use the Graham points, which is what Graham did as a starting point to search for roots. So if you compute this function n at the n minus first Graham point, then by definition, theta of g sub n minus one would be equal to pi times n minus one. The pi gets divided out. So what survives is n minus one. And then you have a plus one, and then you have this mysterious S function. But we know from Littlewood that the S of t function is zero on average. So very often you'll hit probably a value of S that is zero or near zero. So like the actual value of the zeros counting function at the n minus first gram point, maybe it's probably gonna be close to n. So you, you, if, you, if you start finding roots of z of t near this gram point, you'll probably be finding the nth zero of zeta. So that was Graham's idea. And instead of just going and randomly looking for sign, cha sign changes. Right. Um, so, okay, the gram points, if you wanna compute them, it's easy. You just have to basically try to find a value of T that uh, gives you a number equal to uh, pi N. And then if you use like, if you reverse engineer this, then like a good guess for the end gram point would be given by this quantity two pi n over log n. And then you can take this and plug it into a root finding program to actually find a precise value for the end gram point. So he, here's uh, just like a very naive implementation of this in Mathematica, again, using the find root function. And I'm finding here the 998th gram point. And then I search for a root of z of t near that gram point. And I'm finding the 999th zeta zero that I found before, right? And so to find the next one, maybe I move to the next gram interval and see what happens. Okay, are there any questions? Right, yeah, the gram intervals, like their width decays with T like one over log T, right? Right, so, okay, well, okay. Now we have a kind of a, an organization, a way to organize search for zeros of zeta. But when you're doing this, you're gonna be ending up like evaluating Z of T, evaluating Z of T um, at multiple nearby points, right? When you're doing your bisection or when you're doing your root finding. So the question becomes is like, do you really need to recompute the whole main sum which is this, this is the whole mean sum in the Riemann-Ziegel formula. Each time from scratch, even if you're computing the sum for neighboring t's, like ones that are close to each other, uh, on the surface, it seems like, yeah, maybe you have to redo the whole thing each time. But if you consider the phase function, this is the stuff that makes this hard to compute. It's the cancellation that is caused by the phase function. The phase function, uh, the phase function is like phi of k, so, and phi of x is t log x. So if you substitute k for x here, this is what you'll get. Theta t is in the phase, but that's predictable. That's not like something we worry about. What we worry about is this t log k because the logarithm is moving and this is moving you around the unit circle when a phase on the unit circle and you could end up anywhere. You don't know really where you're gonna end up. There isn't an obvious pattern. But even though, if you look at this phase function and consider the value of that phase function at x sub zero, some point, and then at another point, x sub one, and suppose x one and x zero are related by this relation. So there, there are distance delta uh, apart. Then using that same expansion for the logarithm that I explained last time also, 
but instead this time I take more terms, then you can see that the value of the phase function at x1 would be related to the value at x0. Uh, and really, uh, you get a kind of a good approximation just by taking these terms, provided that delta over x0 is small compared to one over the square root of t. Uh, so I probably should say here the first two terms, not three terms, because this condition is saying that the third term will be small. Right, if you imagine delta over x zero is about one over square root of t, then you square this, you get one over t, right? So you're saying that this last term here is small in size. And so you get an approximation for the phase at x one from its value at x zero plus some correction term. So there seems to be some relation, at least if you're looking at neighboring points that are not too far apart, right? And this is the basically, you know, in a very kind of naive way, the idea of VSCO uh, to exploit this to evaluate zeta at multiple nearby points without having to redo the. Um, he has two ways, like two algorithms for doing this. And I'm going to talk about the algorithm using band limited interpolation. Um, there's another one called the Odisco Shanhage algorithm, which I'm not going to talk about. But this is uh, this technique, band limited interpolation. Um, according to Lusco, this comes from signal processing and communications engineering, something that I just mathematically may be familiar with, but I know really nothing about. Um, and it allows you to kind of re re reconstruct like a function from samples of its point, of its values. So let me give a quick overview because that's a really really, really a useful method, not only for these computations, but in general. So um, suppose you have a function g of t, which is band limited by alpha. So it has this representation. What this means is that the Fourier transform of big g of t will be supported between minus alpha and alpha, right? And the Fourier transform of big g of t will be zero outside of that. So it's band limited, the highest band, the highest frequency it has is alpha. Right. In this situation, it's known that such a band limited function can be recovered exactly from its values at these kinds of points. If you sample the values at uh, points which are pi over alpha apart, then to evaluate g of t at any point, you just look at the, you know, a bunch of samples close to you and sum them up. Right. And this holds in general settings, not only G satisfies some regularity, re regularity conditions, but even if G is a finite sum of um, delta functions, like in the sense, don't worry about this if you, like, yeah, this doesn't make sense, but in the sense of distributions, this kind of idea still works. Right? Okay, so um, in this case, like there's an actual formula called the cardinal, cardinal series for G of T, a band limited function with band alpha. So you have the value of g of t is given by this infinite sum, right? So, okay, why are we talking about this? Because um, our main sum in the riemann zegel formula is band limited, right? Our main sum satisfies this equality where f sub k1 is given by this band limited sum. This is band limited because if you look at the highest frequency, here's the phase function t log k, the highest frequency that appears is t log k1, where k1 is the length of the mean sum. And we know that k1 is bounded by square root of t. So the highest frequency here is like if you, uh, alpha would be one half log t, right? So we can apply this idea of interpolation to the mean sum of riemann zeigel and then like, you know, speed up computations of the mean sum at ne nearby points. The problem with this is that the cardinal series uh, for interpolation here converges very slowly. Where does the convergence come from? It may not, first of all, be con absolute convergence. And second of all, the really only obvious decaying term is this linear kind of term. Like things, this term here decays linearly with them. That's, that's the main thing that's giving you decay. You could have a decay due to dg itself, but you cannot rely on this in general, right? Right, so because of the slow convergence of this, this, you know, it may be more expensive to compute uh, 
your function f using a cardinal series than to actually compute it using the original definition. Okay, so let's go solve this problem. Uh, so the solution is, okay, well, uh, we're gonna, we can sample our band limited sum fk1 at a denser grid of points than is like, you know, um, required by the cardinal, ser cardinal series. Um, so instead of sampling at points like pi over alpha, we're gonna sample at points pi over beta where beta is some number greater than alpha. Right, so the spacing between our, our samples is gonna be smaller. So for example, I'm gonna take for the rest of this beta to be two L. So I'm gonna be sampling my uh, band limited sum uh, at twice the rate that is required by um, the cardinal series. Uh, of course, sampling more makes the, you know, the pre-computation of the samples, you know, less efficient because you have to do more pre-computations of, you know, of, of values of the function, but then it makes the recovery process, the interpolation process faster because of the faster conversions you get from this sped up cardinal series, right? So that's the idea is that, uh, that's the main advantage. You're gonna get much faster decay than, than provided by the sync function uh, by sampling at a denser grid of points than pi over alpha. Yes. Which function f? Yeah, I mean you can apply the triangle inequality to it. It's a finite sum, uh, so you can apply triangle inequality and approximate the sum you get by an integral. So you can bound it by uh, square root of t, basically. Right. Any other questions? Right. Okay. So in the process of more sampling, then you have this additional flexibility of what's usually called uh, choosing a, a kernel function. You get to choose a kernel function that satisfies certain conditions. Um, you know, I, basically the kernel function is what's gonna give you the faster conversions. Um, the kernel function will be little h and will have a Fourier transform big H. And um, you want big H to be like approximate like a delta function and little h will be its Fourier transform. And then there's gonna be basically an inverse relation between the width where big H is supported and where little h is basically supported. The wider the support of big H, the narrower little h and vice versa. <laughs> yeah, so, right. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you'll get a, like an explicit formula. Here is an inter, inter, interpolation formula. You have the same sync function that appeared in the card, cardinal series, but then you have this additional number or function h. And we're gonna choose h to make the series converge much more quickly, right? So here is a, what little h and big h look like. The orange one is basically supported on a small thing, small interval, and then little h is, wider, but still, you know, outside of a, like an interval, which is not too long, it's practically zero. And this choice is what Odisco found, it works very well. If you, this is the explicit formula for it, um, you can choose, see it's gonna be some positive number. Typically you're gonna choose like 20, 25, 30. But what happens with little h is that uh, up to uh, u equal to c over epsilon, uh, you're gonna get like, you know, gradual decay. But then once u passes c over epsilon, the cinch fu function switches to a sync function because the stuff under the square root becomes negative and then you get like an i, uh, an imaginary. So it just uh, switches to a bounded sync function and then it's multiplied by something which is exponentially small in c. The cinch of c is like e to the minus c. So this is the behavior thing here. It's like this gradual decay. So I think I chose C here to be 20. So there's a gradual decay um, up to 20 and then it's practically zero after that. Yep. So this is kind of the main behavior, right? 
So the kind of like the, the reason why this is important to keep track of because basically the width of the interval where h, little h is not equal to zero is the length of the sum you need to account for in the interpolation formula. Right. Okay, so here's a, an implementation of this bad limited stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if there are any comments about it. You can copy and paste it and try to experiment with it. But I think, right, so I just define the parameters that appear. So I'm doing here computations using this interpolation for T around 100,000. Uh, the parameter C, I chose it to be 20. Um, here's alpha. I think I, I took alpha to be larger than one half log T. I took it to be log T to sample even more. Uh, and get more accuracy. And then I, I stuck to the formula for beta. And then the rest of it is, is the same as, you know, the only annoying issue with this is like the indexing and re-indexing stuff, like because, you know, you store the samples in a table somewhere here. So I think it's right here. And then your table like is indexed now starting at one, but in your mind, the index is like some number between minus something and plus some. So you have to do this translations of the index. Like it's annoying, but it's, uh, well, it's what you have to do. Yes. Oh, oh, right. So uh, you have to be careful because like the interpolation formula assumes you're sampling the same function at these points. So if you're passing a point where the main sum jumps by one, then you're, you'd be sampling like not the main sum you need, but a different function. So when you do the interpolation, you will not recover the correct. Yeah, it, it, it has to be the same exponential sum. The exponential sum itself cannot be changing depending on, on the sample where you're sampling. It has to, to be the same exponential sum. Um, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, here is the error in this interpolation formula. Um, again, around 10 to the five, and I took alpha to be a log of T and choosing C to be 20. You notice how the actual error matches very well, the expectation. The expectation comes from this cinch, the hyperbolic uh, sign uh, of C, which is like E to the minus C. And this is about 10 to the minus nine, which is what you're seeing here, right? So it's an accurate formula and you can make it more accurate by taking C larger if you want. Right, so at this point you have like, you know, there's enough to actually do like more extensive computations uh, to do statistics of the ordinates of zeros or to check, um, you know, whether an interval may contain like whether it's like, you know, the zeros appear to satisfy the Riemann hypothesis uh, so the, the, um, the steps are first, you have to pre-compute the main sum at a, like, or something related to the main sum, this, this function on a dense enough grid of points, like maybe spacing one over log of T. And then you find the ground points where you pre-computed and this is easy to do. And then you use this band limited interpolation technique and then you can quickly compute, you know, by accounting for the correction term in the riemann Ziegel formula, uh, so add that in. So then you can easily compute Z of T anywhere in that interval where you sample without having to redo the whole main sum each time. And you can keep this data of the pre-computation here because you know, in the future, like you come up with another idea, I wanna study the max of zeta between, you know, in certain intervals, then you can use the same pre-computation to do, to do this. You don't have to have to discard it and redo the whole thing. Right, so this this kind of strategy can can work to like look at statistics of zeros or you know similar computation. Right, but okay. Suppose now we did these computations, we found a bunch or a, a list of ordinates. We want to check is the Riemann hypothesis true in that interval where we found the ordinates of the zeros. 
right? And uh, this is an amazing idea during uh, due to Turing, Russell, and Lehman. It came in stages, right? So let me I, I let me try to explain how like kind of developed. Okay, so we looked at uh, um, Graham's law. Graham's law said you, usually there is a sign change of z of t between two consecutive Gram points, which means usually there is a zero of z of t between two consecutive Gram points. So suppose um, that you don't find a sign change in a given Gram interval, right? In this case, the natural thing to do is maybe look for extra sign changes or for the missing sign changes in the neighboring Gram intervals. Maybe this one doesn't contain any, but the one before it contains like, you know, two rather than one. So, yeah, question? Okay, or you, so you can do this, but like it was found more efficient by Russell to organize the search, not by gram intervals, but by gram blocks. So to define a gram block, you can define uh, you have to define a good gram point. It's a funny name, but it's a good gram point is one that satisfies this uh, equation. And a bad gram point is one that doesn't. Um, and okay, the relevance here is that the Gram's law in terms of this inequality states that the inequality usually holds. Because if this usually holds, then the sign at GN will be the opposite of the sign as GN plus one, will be the opposite of the sign as GN plus two and so on and so, so in between each consecutive gram points, you're finding a sign change, meaning you're locating a zero, right? So a gram block then is an interval where the first gram point is good and the last one is good, but all the stuff in between is bad, does not satisfy this, um, in, this inequality, right? So for example, if you have a, a gram a block of length two, then possible sign patterns for it would be plus, plus, plus. The plus here would mean that, you know, I mean, we're assuming this one is good and this one is, is good. The plus here would say that the middle one is bad, right? Uh, or it could be minus, 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 but it can't be plus, minus, plus, because this would be an alternating pattern, which would, so this would be two gram blocks. Each gram block is just a single gram interval, right? Okay, so um, you can, instead of searching like uh, by gram intervals, you can search by gram blocks. And uh, if you're missing sign changes, then you can look at neighbor and gram blocks rather than gram intervals, right? And the reason that this was useful is because Russell noticed that a gram block of length K, so the length is this K here, right? Usually contains at least K zeros. Right. Again, if this rule held universally, then the Riemann hypothesis would be implied, but it fails infinitely often by the same Salberg result that S of t is unbounded. Right. But uh, what can happen is that if you have missing sign changes in a gram block, you're finding less than k zero, then you can look in the neighboring gram blocks, and gives you this gives you a way to organize your search. Right, and now comes on top of this is the method of Turing Lehman. It's really Turing's idea, but basically Turing's paper was was like full of like kind of mistakes. You know, the, the numbers he calculated were not quite correct, but he had the idea was robust. It was an excellent idea, and so Lehman came in and actually corrected everything and made sure that the numbers worked out. Um, so what this method allows you to do is to compute n of t at isolated point for large t. Okay, so right now, if I compute all the zeros up to a given height t, then I can count them, right? And then I can say n of t is at least that number of sign changes I found. What Turing is, method is doing is that I don't need to know anything about all the zeros down to like, you know, at the beginning. I can look at a, just an isolated large value of t and by using data, in a small neighborhood of that large value of t, I can actually compute n of t usually, exactly. Okay, so it's it's kind of something surprising, uh, like when the, on the face of it, how can you do this without knowing how many zeros there are like from the beginning? Right, so what, what this method is based on is a couple of observations. The first one is easy enough. First, the value of s at a gram point must be an integer. Right, because S of GN, so we're looking at the nth gram point, 
is equal to this difference. N of Gn is an integer always. And by definition of Gn is the solution of, you know, th this should be equal to pi, pi times n. So this is equal to, uh, sorry, I have a, a plus, I should have a plus one here, I'm missing a plus one. But anyway, you have a difference of two integers, right? So you know that the S function, S of T function is an integer at gram point. And if the gram point is good, then you can um, just by keeping track of the parity of the number of zeros, you can prove that S of GN must be an even integer. Um, Right, because if you're at a good gram point, then the only way you've gotten to that point and the gram point still was good is either one, like a combination of two things. Either you missed an even number of zeros on the critical line. So like when you did, you went like down and then up. And so like at the end, you did not disturb the pattern of good gram points or you miss zeros off the critical line but in this case, you would have to miss two because of the symmetry about the critical line. Either way, you're missing an even number. And so using this, you can prove that at a gram point, S of G n must be even, an even integer. And this is useful because um, then if you wanna compute S of G n at a, like show that's equal to zero at a good gram point, so all you have to do is that it's bounded by two, strictly less than two. Right? And if you can compute S of GN, then you can compute N of, G, N of GN because N of GN is like, there's nothing mysterious about it except for the S of T function. So if you figure this out, then you figured out the whole thing. Right, so this was Turing's idea about how to prove a bound like this. And it relies on an explicit version of Littlewood's theorem that, oh, um, sorry, uh, this, I don't know, this is messed up, this is completely wrong. Uh, like I shouldn't be saying S of T is less than T. What I meant to write here is Littlewood had a theorem that the integral of S of T is bounded by log of T. I don't know how this came up here. So there's a, a theorem of Littlewood, which I displayed in the first lecture, which says that not only is S of T bounded by log of T, but that the average goes to zero very quickly. And this was basically the observe uh, that uh, you know the theorem that the integral of s of t up to t is bounded by log of t. So Turing found an explicit version of this, so with actual constants, and with a you know an applicability region. So you know that this inequality is applicable as soon as t one, t two and t one are larger than this number. So if you integrate s of t between t one and t two for any t two and t one that satisfy this inequality, the integral would be bounded by this. Okay, and using this, you can prove upper and lower bound on S of GN. Ima imagine like you mistakenly assume S of GN is greater than two, then this additional number, like this you know, additional size you're adding, will kind of mess up the average, will make the average grow too fast, right? And to apply this, you need both, like you need the, like, a, like a, a list of sign changes you found before the end ground point and after. One side will give you an upper bound and one side will give you a lower bound. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, there is a convenient way to apply this method, which is what like really Lehman's main contribution, which is that, um, you know, by checking a simple inequality here, um, if you look, so here we have a, a union of P disjoint gram blocks, right? And if you know that the number of disjoint gram blocks in this union satisfies this inequality, and you know that each gram block satisfies Russell's rule, meaning that you found at least K sign changes or like the length of the, the block sign changes within each, this is Russell's rule then you can conclude upper and lower bounds of the zeros counting function at the beginning of the interval and at the end. And you can do this in two, on two sides of GN, and then you can, uh, if things work out, if S of GN is indeed equal to zero, you can prove it this way. You might get unlucky and S of GN is not actually equal to zero. 
In this case, we're not going to be able to prove it. But S, S of t is so often very small that if you just move to the next or the next or next, you try just a few times, eventually you hit one, which is zero. And then you just need one point like this, and then you can compute the uh, uh, S at that point and therefore compute N. Right. Okay, uh, maybe before I move, uh, are there any questions? Okay, so the main application of this, um, like for this uh, lecture is about statistics of the zeros ordinates. So we've already seen that these get denser as the height increases, right? Because of this asymptotic, this asymptotic is like comes from, you know, this is the term contributed by one over pi theta of t, and then you just use the expansion for theta of t. And because the zeros get denser, the higher up, uh, it's useful to kind of space them out so that they have the same mean spacing. And this would allow you to compare their statistics at different heights, right? By normal, so like you kind of put everything on an even ground, like if you're looking at like 10 to the 40, you space them out so that they have even space, like mean spacing one. And then if you're looking at 10 to the 20, t is equal to 10 to the 20, you space them out also so that their average spacing is one. And then you can compare the statistics at these very vastly different heights, right? Because you put them on an even ground, they're comparable, right? And you can do this in two ways. You can either normalize the uh, spacings between consecutive ordinates. So these are consecutive ordinates. You can normalize them by multiplying by the, uh, by dividing out essentially by the average space, which corresponds to multiplying by this factor. And if you do this, and then you, you look at a list of delta sub n. So this is this, the normalized spacing between the n and plus, n plus first uh, ordinate. If you look at a list of those, then they will have mean value one, right? Otherwise, you can uh, rescale the ordinates themselves by multiplying by this factor. And then if you look at the gamma tilde, these are the scaled ordinates, then you look at their differences or their spacing, it will have mean spacing one for a similar reason as this. Either way, you could do it. Right? Okay. So, um, right. Well, and the reason I'm defining this is because I want to get to the pair correlation conjecture. So uh, Montgomery is a, uh, was interested, he's a very, um, like contributed so much to analytic number theory. He was interested in, in studying the distribution of the uh, zeta zeros. And um, he made this conjecture. So on, and I'm gonna get to the story of this conjecture in the next slide. Um, but here's a, here, here it is. If you look basically at all the uh, rescaled zeros um, in the language, like, you know, using that rescaling we had, and you look at the rescaled ones whose spacing lies between alpha and beta. So let me think alpha is like one, beta is two. They just have to be positive and beta should be larger than alpha, right? So you wanna count how many pairs up to high T are there so that their normalized spacing is between alpha and beta. And he made that, and, and then you wanna like find this and divide by n of t here, by the total number of zeros. He conjectured that this is asymptotically given by this simple integral. Right. And you can test uh, this out. This is uh, from around uh, 10 to the 28. The, this is the density function there's probably a D sub U here, or D of U missing. Sorry about this. Uh, but this is the density function, the one minus sine pi U over pi U squared. So when U is near zero, the sinc function here becomes one almost. So the one minus the sinc when U is near zero will be almost zero, which is what you see at the beginning. And then as U increases, you get the decay from the U in the denominator. So this thing kind of tends to zero and what survives is the one. So it'd be oscillating kind of gradually and less and less so about one. So what, this is what you're seeing here, right? And I can compute easily this uh, density function in the pair correlation. And then 
use data from around 10 to the 28. I'm using maybe 10 million zeros from that height. And then, you know, count how many spacings I have for different uh, alphas and betas. And it can match the two things, they match very well. Not only visually, if you actually compute the difference between the data and the conjecture, the difference is fluctuating about 10 to the minus four, which is very good agreement. Because many times these th things are like converging like on a logarithmic scale, like the speed of convergence, like one over log of t. So 10 to the minus four is actually very good. Um, okay, um, any questions about this? So, yes. Where does this integral? Yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get, so, right, so, um, what Montgomery did is he used, like the, there is a, uh, like a whole class of formulas in analytic number theory called explicit formulas. The explicit formulas, they have usually two sides. One side is the primes and the other side is the zeros. And they're useful, useful because usually we don't know anything about the zeros, but we know a little bit more about the primes. So what Montgomery did is he didn't study this, you know, function directly. He studied like a Fourier transform of this. And using an explicit formula, he related that to a sum over the primes, which he could analyze. And so by pure calculation, he found that, you know, under certain hypotheses, he did not prove this in full, but proved partial cases, uh, right? That this asymptotic should be expected. I sent like in the notes, I think uh, one, like one of the pages, like, uh, I don't know if you're on the mailing list, but it's, there's more detail in there about how this comes up. Um, right, any other questions? So, so, so the, the, the main thing is that the use of the explicit formulas, like one example of explicit formula that I mentioned is from the first lecture, Riemann's formula, that's an explicit formula. It relates the primes counting function to a sum over zeros. Another example was Landau formula, right? Which had that these spikes at the logarithms of the primes. Those are explicit formulas. So, and they have the zeros on one side, you have the primes on the other side, and that's how you can try to begin to analyze such things. Right? Okay. Um, the, this attracted a lot of attention because of this behavior near at the beginning. What this is saying is that it's very rare for consecutive zeros to be close to each other. The density of such occurrences is tending to zero. And in like more kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, like uh, like the different languages, the, the people like to say that the zeros repel each other. They don't like to be close to each other. And this can be like a hint. That's why maybe this could be a hint to, uh, could this provide a way to proving the Riemann hypothesis? Because you could think of a, a multiple zero as something approaching almost a counter example to the Re Riemann hypothesis. Okay, because, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that they repel each other is kind of, um, was very, very important and interesting um, that the zeros don't like to stay close to each other. So this behavior right here. There's also interesting behavior that actually if you, it happens if you go all the way far, back, far out, uh, but uh, let's leave this for another day. <laughs> right, so let me explain the Montgomery, um, conjecture, how it kind of came about. So this is a kind of a, like he tells this story. This is a quote from Montgomery. He was visiting at IES in 1972. And uh, there is a mathematical physicist, Freeman Dyson, very well known, uh, was based at IES. And uh, Montgomery was a graduate student at that point. Um, and he was just meeting people there. And uh, apparently he had this conversation with Freeman Dyson that asked him what he's working on. And he mentioned the stuff on the distribution or, or the zero spacings. And that he found that uh, it has density given by this function. So immediately Dyson said, that's the same as you find for random matrices. He was talking about something called GUE, like a certain ensemble of random matrices. 
And then like, you know, this was the end of it, but then like Selberg, whom I talked about earlier and has contributed a, a lot to the theory of Zeta, uh, can continue the conversation in a written note telling Montgomery that he should look at Meta's book on random matrix theory, where this density function comes up for random matrices, right? And Meta is kind of a, a standard reference in that area of random matrix theory, at least for mathematical physics. So this is the story. It was accidental, right? That the you know the, the, that the connection between these two things were noticed was noticed, right? And okay, well, conjecture is conjecture. What really this gave, gave gave this a huge push is the numerical data. I mean, this whole thing that's the main thing that's supporting it is the numerical data. When you actually go higher up and then you try to compute the you know pair correlation like I did here you'll find very good agreement, right? And not only for pair correlation, you can com compute many statistics about the zeros predicted by random matrices, like the nearest neighbor spacing function right here. I'm, I'm giving the formulas here. Uh, this was a master's student who used data I had computed. The, the red dots are the data. The blue line is the prediction from random matrix theory. And he compared the prediction and data at two heights. This one is around 10 to the 12. This one is around 10 to the 28. And you see as the height increases, how much the agreement improves. Right? So there's here some fluctuation, but by the time around 10 to the 12, by the time we get to the 10 to the 28, it's, it's, it's really very good. Right? Okay, and why was this interesting that like zeta zeros are being connected to random matrices? Well, it's because of a vague conjecture. Uh, it's, it's called the hilbert polya conjecture. And it's really big. Um, here's a quote from Polya that tries to explain it. Basically it's saying that the Riemann hypothesis should be true because of a, like a physical reason essentially. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what this means, but it, it is somehow that the zeros of zeta should be the eigenvalues of a Hermitian matrix and the Hermitian matrix has real eigenvalues. And therefore the zeros of zeta have to be real for that reason, but the Hermitian matrix would probably be expressing something physical also. So, but uh, yeah, that's the quote from Polya about explaining what is meant by the Hilbert Polya conjecture. Um, and this kind of newly discovered connection between, you know, random matrix theory and Zeta came in the spirit of this conjecture. And so there was a lot of excitement but there have been many interesting results since then supporting the connection between zeta and random matrices. But these things still remain speculative in the sense that we haven't really proven rigorously many things. And the other thing is that random matrix theory does not know about arithmetic contributions. It does not know really about the primes. It knows about the statistics of zeros, local ones. But if you look back at this, oh, sorry. If you look back at this graph here, I mentioned if you go far out, you get interesting behavior. Suddenly you're gonna start seeing like big dips in several places. And these dips are not captured by random matrix theory. They're caused by the primes. So the long range behavior is affected by the primes and random matrices do not know about it. So the connection is limited to that extent, but it's still very interesting. I mean, it's telling us a lot more than we already know and many times telling us what conjectures are the, you know, like make sense to make. Right, so the, at the beginning, the connection was really between an ensemble from mathematical physics called GOE, Gaussian Unitary Ensemble. But since then, it has been realized that the math is simpler and we get the same statistics. If you look at the unitary group, this is the group of N by N unitary matrices. You can relate then the eigenphases, the eigenvalues of this will be on the unit circle. So you can get an eigen, eigenphases. You can relate these eigenphases and the value distribution of the characteristic polynomial of this uh, to the distribution of normalized zeta ordinates and the value distribution of zeta itself on the critical line. And this might not look like a, a random uh, group. I mean, this is why, what's random about this? Well, the, the randomness is like the probability measure that's being used here is just, uh, it's called the Haar measure on the unitary group. And that's, that's what gives you a probability measure uh, 
to express things in, the, in that language. Right, so this is the idea is that the zeros of zeta somehow are being modeled by eigenphases of unitary matrices. So this is a unitary, these are expressing the eigenphases of a unitary matrix, which is 17 by 17. And the maybe a very exciting thing is that this connection is made not only in the limit as n and t go to infinity, but even for finite, but large, n and t. Uh, provided you make this identification. What you find is that the statistics of zeros around high t are being captured by n by n unitary matrices of dimension about log t over two pi, right? So it's not only the asymptotic or limit of convergence, it's the rate of convergence is somehow also being captured. So that's very good support for it. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, any questions from uh, our uh, participants the uh, online? I see the chat. Yeah, I don't know, the chat is not coming up. Oh, okay. So sorry, it seems that uh, we have a technical issue with seeing the chat from yeah. the participants. Usually it sounds like something comes down when you go. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there we go, yeah. No, it's, it's fine. Yeah. No, it's not fine. I thought I thought it came down. Hey, luck. Oh, it's locked. <laughs> okay. Hello, it's on the chat. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, uh, Professor Hayari, for the amazing mini course. I hope this will uh, be the beginning of uh, more activities on the topic. Uh, I think those of you who really felt that there is one part that they can really uh, go in depth more about these topics or want to learn more about it, We'll be happy to start linking with uh, Professor Hayari and send him emails and ask him more about this stuff. So any one of you feels that this is the kind of math it talks to you, you should talk back to her or to it. Okay. Thank you very much and see you in later activities. Bye.